Hi there. Good morning, Dr. Vander Hayden. How are you? Good. Good. How are you? I'm doing well. Good. I'm excited to dig in on class-wide intervention now. Um, do I'm happy for people to sort of step away if they need a break. Do you want me to go ahead and start then so we stay on track? Yep, that sounds great. Okay. So let me close this one. Now I do have this link. Let's see if I can put it in the chat before I start sharing my screen. And that's the link to the flexible learning plan document. Oh, we did take care of it. So we're good. We, oh, we, you are, we got it. We got it out to everybody and we got it loaded on the folder for you. I can't, I'm so impressed. Amazing. Okay. Share screen. Matt, Matt, our, Matt who is a, a huge fan of spring math, uh, already has an account and was able to do it once you gave us the okay. Ah, you know what? I tell a story about Matt all the time that he probably doesn't know, but um, he asked me over maybe Twitter, would I meet with him to talk about the research under, you know, yeah. under words, um, spring math? I said, of course, sure. It's Pennsylvania. I, my policy is I always say yes to anyone from Pennsylvania. So we start having this meeting. I'm going through the data, right? Oh, the, well, this, and then we studied this, and then we think about this, and then these other people's data, you know, we extended what they did in this way. And he, like, interrupts me as I'm blah, 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 about 30 minutes in, and he's like, oh, my gosh, you actually have real data. <laughs> 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 like the highest compliment anybody could could pay me because yes we wish to have real data we also we're also always conducting research so um robin cotting and i are going to do an rct this year actually be in, in the boston area okay so uh gonna start um, with the yep go right ahead i'll right in Start with a joke. Uh, all these kids been learning the Common Core, about to learn how to carry the one from their new homeschool teachers, which were their parents in the spring. And we're like, oh no. I mean, if you're a math teacher, this panics you. It's really hard to undo bad habits in instruction. So we really usually want to, it's called errorless learning, right? We want to avoid those wrong discriminations, we would say in the behavioral world, um, from ever getting established with kids because it'll cost you so much more instruction to remove later. So I wanna talk about today, class-wide intervention and how to do it and why it matters. So luckily um, in math, it, performance is highly predictable. So we know basically these are the high level milestones that if you do not hit these milestones, you have a much lower probability of successfully actually enrolling in a two or four year college program, can you believe? Um, completing a two or four year college program, lower post-secondary income. Um, uh, basically, because success is so highly predictable, it gives us a roadmap. We want children to attain these understandings at these timelines in their, develop their mathematical development. But it's also a great model to detect risk because we know when children do not meet these milestones, they're not going to meet the future milestones that put them on track to have all their options available to them. I'm not saying every child on the planet should go to, the, go to college, but every child on the planet should have the option to if they want to. And enrolling in a remedial math course when you get to college is the number one predictor that you will not complete that college degree in any academic major. Did you know that? Um, there's something terrible about that. And the rates of completion at colleges, I just read this because I've got a college bound kid very shortly, are abysmal. Most kids are not finishing it. Like a very small percentage of kids actually finish within five years. We should, we should be aiming to do better. And I think part of that is the way in which we prepare children to have success when they arrive at that, that level of expectation in their first year of college. So avoiding having to put your kids that leave your school into remedial. And when I say leave your school, I mean your system. You start with them at kindergarten. Sometimes they move in, but theoretically they have a K-12 experience. And when they leave that experience, my goal would be 100% of those children who choose to should be able to avoid remedial math when they get to college. That's a very like socially meaningful outcome in life that can be an economic gateway for these children. It's super important. My favorite study that came out in 2019 was published by Sharon Kuhn. I don't know her. I just know her work. She's actually at the Florida Center for Reading Research. She did this study in Mississippi. And this study just 
got my attention. So she examined what was the difference in the probability of children meeting the ACT college readiness benchmark in math on the ACT, um, given that they were enrolled in certain course sequence tracks in high school, which included advanced and included remedial. And here's the takeaway. After you corrected for what those children knew how to do in fifth grade math performance on the state test, there was no difference. So a child taking a remedial course track versus a child taking an advanced course track had the advanced course track did not produce um, higher success in meeting the college readiness benchmarks. In fact, it had no predictive value. <gasps> Can you believe that? I don't understand why this study is not like all, I think it's because people don't like flow chart. Clearly we know people don't like math. Now that we've been through the testing debacle that we have been through in our country, we understand most people don't understand math in this country, but this study, we should be sort of really yelling from the rooftops. This is a this is highlighting that which I you know is apparent here. If you want to be successful in more advanced math content, you must be successful in the kindergarten, first grade, second, third, especially measurable by fifth grade proportion understanding. That's the cliff of misunderstanding. That if children do not master that, they will not be able to profit from more advanced instruction that they could receive in high school, which could make them ready for success in college, okay? So now we have a new goal. So the first goal, help everybody avoid having to take remedial math who wants to go to college, right? Second goal, make everybody proficient in fifth grade in fractions and proportional understandings. Okay, we do to do that, we have to attain these earlier milestones. That's basically how it works. I think this is such a huge finding, okay. I, I highlighted that already and I highlighted this already. So how can we do that? We can use within MTSS tier one and a half class-wide math intervention. It is efficient. It, it really only takes 15 minutes a day if you, if you train your people to do this well. Veteran teachers in our research studies implement in 12 minutes a day at the elementary level. And teachers who are newer to the tool, like within the first year, take about 15 minutes. Um, it's, we say class-wide math intervention is specifically developed to be curriculum neutral or curriculum agnostic, if you like that term. It is a supplement, it is not a replacement for core, but it can be paired with any math curriculum for optimal, um, to produce a value add in, in learning and mathematics. So all children show growth, um, but the ones who fall behind, those are the children who we know to be in trouble. We now know we can, they are, that is much more accurate than even static screening assessments or even year-end test scores. We can outperform year-end test scores from the preceding year if we're using a class-wide intervention trial to determine who needs uh, intervention. So if, if our goal is above the green is uh, not at risk and below the green is at risk, then this is a picture of a class-wide problem. The rule that we use is the median score, which is the middle kid in the class, the middle performing kid is in the frustrational range of performance or the at-risk range of performance on a grade level expected learning uh, expectation for that time of year. So we're using different screenings at fall winter and spring and we are using single skill basically some are multiple skill but not like we're not trying to have a general outcome measure I don't I'll tell you is my opinion of many many years of research that that just doesn't work it doesn't serve us in mathematics so we're using what's called subskill mastery measurement which means we can get a um, Ben Solomon is a big assessment guru type methods guy and he called it the Goldilocks effect. So if you're measuring the right skill at the right window, you can be much more accurate and sensitive to determine risk and to monitor progress toward re removing yourself from the risk category. So my recommendation to you is forget about GOM measures. There's a reason you don't feel satisfied when you're using those um, in your MTSS system. They are not sensitive for detecting growth. They're not really accurate in terms of screening. They tend to be specific. So they go, if you screen with a, what you think is a GOM, it's usually a multi-skill measure. Um, in math, this is not true for reading, by the way, this only pertains to math, but if you screen with a GOM and a child does not pass that screener, then there is a, 
definitely the child has a problem. That's an accurate decision. But if the child passes the screener, the child is like potentially likely to still have a problem. That's a false negative error. So these measures are notorious for being specific but not being sensitive. Subskill mastery measurements are sensitive. So they avoid false negative errors. And then the follow-up, if you have a base rate issue of risk, as you do here, that class-wide intervention from a psycho, you know, assessment perspective, um, psychoeducational assessment, technical adequacy perspective, what it's really doing is it's changing your base rate. So it's allowing you to make a more accurate determination about who is at risk. And that is mathematically, like we could proof this out. I'd love to do, I could do that talk, but let's, we won't go there. We'll focus on the instruction piece. Unless people have questions, put it in the chat and I'm happy to answer it and I can do it sort of live. And actually I recorded a session for NASP that is in the public domain. Anybody can look at it on academic screening post COVID. And I go into this particular issue in great depth and actually unpack the metrics and how they work. And it's a 45 minute talk and you do not have to be a NASP member to access it, it's online and it's free. I donated my time. I did a series for them uh, over the last few months. So if you can't find it, I'll send you a link to it. I'm happy for people to who really want to understand the assessment piece to have access to that. So we say, if you've got a class-wide problem, do a class-wide intervention. The other thing that it does help you do, and I showed this graph before, so this is the fall screening in first grade. These are real data, I've just covered up names, but all of the class except for one child is performing in the risk range. And then at the winter screening, the skill has become more challenging. My little circle's moved, but the skill has gone from sums to six to sums to 12, because we expect first graders by winter to be doing sums to 12. I think this is winter, um, then we are looking, we will see an improvement. So we go to a harder skill, but we go from 4% proficient to 81% proficient. Well, what happened in the interim? What happened in the interim was class-wide math intervention. So you can see indications with no new assessment, but just what you normally do for your screening fall, winter, and spring, you can see improved proficiency even with more challenging screenings during the course of the same year. You should be able to see that in any tool. I showed this in the last session. I'm gonna skip over that. Okay, so the instructional hierarchy and how it works. Um, let me see, I wanted to do, oh good, that's it. Good, I already have, I'm gonna do it here and then I'll go back, um, I think. Since I didn't show this slide in the last one, I wanna make sure, okay, that's not the right. Yes. Okay. All right, so this is the uh, instructional hierarchy unpacked, and this is the scientific basis for instructional design that I think has the most evidence, and it is the basis for everything I do. If I were going to come into your school and advise you on how to do MTSS for reading, which I wouldn't do, I would recommend that you hire somebody else who's closer to that work now, but my framework for doing it would look like this, so it works for reading. Um, this is Matt Burns' approach to reading consultation, same thing for Robin Cotting, uh, Gary Duhon, Brian Ponce, folks like that, um, and Ed Shapiro and would have been, and Joe Kovaleski, of course, Tim Rungi. This is my approach for math, uh, and it works like this. So when a skill is new, all skills will progress through three levels of proficiency. And when a skill is frustrational, that just means it's a new understanding. And what will happen is performance will improve sort of, you know, incrementally and gradually in an upward fashion, but errors will be high initially and they will come down. So the effect that we're having when a task is frustrational is we're trying to build accuracy. We don't really care how fast children are. We first want them to accurately understand the conditions under which a response is correct and a response is incorrect. Once a child becomes accurate and highly accurate, I mean, then the child will enter what is called the instructional range of performance. And what will happen is performance will actually uptick. So their academic growth will become faster. There's a paper in press right now from Ben Solomon that I handled as an AE and I uh, reported exactly this effect. It's really a, a replicated effect that when a child enters the instructional range of performance, you get this beautiful uptick in growth that's very powerful. And errors should remain low. And then once you hit a certain level of proficiency, then improvements will level off. You know, And what will happen is we will say, you have now mastered this understanding. And what we need to do is give you the next level of difficulty. You need more difficult work. <laughs> 
But here's the takeaway as a teacher. When you are in, when you're working with students on a new skill, a new understanding, or you're working to build an intervention for a child that needs an acquisition intervention, then there are certain tactics that are appropriate to deliver at that stage of learning, and there are certain tactics that are not appropriate to deliver. Let me explain. So when a child is inaccurate, or they're in the frustrational range of performance, then what we want to do is establish correct understanding accurate independent performance. And so we might think use things like restricting the task, so making it uh, a, a more simply, cleanly, consistently presented task so we don't get confusion about how to respond initially. We are going to emphasize immediate corrective feedback. That's the key active ingredient. That's why frustrational work when it is provided independently to kids fails. They will actually um, learn things incorrectly that will cost you twice as much instruction later to remove that misunderstanding. So you want, your goal is to prevent misunderstanding, which you do by trapping errors immediately and providing immediate corrective feedback. Your feedback might be more elaborate and you could even use things like cues and prompts for correct responding. So hopefully you're taking away from this. That this is supervised instruction. This is what happens in face to face learning that's hard to duplicate in a virtual environment, by the way. So you're teaching a new understanding, but you're doing it in a way that you, the child's understanding is observable to you as a teacher and you can prevent and correct any misunderstandings that you observe until the child becomes accurate independently. Okay. Once that happens, the child is now ready for instructional range tactics. And in the instructional range, the things that served you well when the child was frustrational no longer work. And actually, uh, Matt Burns, Robin Cotting, Lukito, I can't remember all the authors, there's four authors, meta, did this beautiful meta-analysis and famously called this the skill by treatment interaction. And what they demonstrated is that when you misalign the tactics with the proficiency, learning goes down. And by that, I mean, if you are in the instructional range of performance and you continue to use things like a restricted, narrowly defined task, immediate corrective feedback, cues and prompting, elaborate feedback, you will actually cause the learning to take a hit when it should be accelerating. So the things that make learning accelerate once the child has become accurate are the key number one active ingredient is opportunities to respond. So you remember I mentioned this when I talked about Charlie Greenwood's 1991 study when he built class-wide peer tutoring. Class-wide intervention for us, the way I think about it, I'm not sure if uh, the Fuchs would agree, but certainly Charlie defined it this way and that's how we built it. It is intended by design to be a fluency building intervention. So we do not introduce skills that have never been taught in the, in the sort of typical sequence of uh, skill instruction. We always begin, as you'll notice if you use our tool, that we always begin with um, prerequisite understandings that we know children have been taught how to do. And we build fluency on those prerequisites and then the sequence builds. So when you have mastered the earlier skills, it's setting you up to be ready for this, this fluency building instruction that you're going to get in the format of, format of class-wide intervention. For us, acquisition intervention occurs, can occur whole class. We, in our tool, if your median is in the frustrational range when you're in the class-wide intervention dashboard, we will give you an acquisition lesson to reteach that skill. Um, and we really want you to be doing class-wide intervention when children are ready for fluency building instruction, which means your median score should be instructional range or higher. So opportunities to respond is the most critical uh, ingredient of fluency building instruction. Delayed corrective feedback can be tolerated and should be used. Why? Because children are accurate. So if you're interrupting children to tell them that they got a response correct, Think about that. If you've got 10 minutes for the lesson, you're actually reducing the number of opportunities to respond you can embed into that instructional period because you're providing unnecessary corrective feedback. If you're, God forbid, providing prompts and cues for correct responding when children are in the instructional range of performance, you can actually create something that's called cue dependence. And 
I always like to use a parenting analogy for this. If you ever had a child, a young child, and you counted to three to get them to comply, which we've all done, even though we know better, um, all you did really was teach the child to wait until you get to three, or even worse, two and a half, right? Two and three quarters, and they don't master fractions just because you do that. Um, but when you do that, you just teach them to wait for you to give a cue. And so you should not be giving cues and prompts for correct responding when children have entered this instructional range of performance. Why? because they're accurate they don't need that they need to practice independently in order to build their proficiency and the ease which with with which they can do the skill that you're asking them to do now you can vary the task in this range of performance and you want to provide goals and motivation for improved performance so you know you think about this as sort of the growth mindset that we talk about and certainly in my world, we talk about this a lot with little kids and we say, you know, your math brain is like a muscle. And when you work it and you work it by practicing this work and talking about your thinking and explaining your thinking out loud and doing basically class wide math intervention, you are um, getting stronger. You're making your math muscle stronger. And you can talk about it as, you know, your goal is to beat your score from the day before. We, we've used that for years. And that's very uh, appealing to kids. And actually, there's a really um, great body of literature that supports that that alone, that feature alone mitigates anxiety that could be associated with weak um, academic performance and specifically in mathematics. Um, Susan Levine's work and um, trying to think who the other one, Nam Kung and King, that's a great paper. Um, by the way, Robin Cotting and I recorded a five part series on math for the Patent Pod group. And you can access that. That's up on the web for free. We did a session on a math anxiety. We did a session on uh, the instructional hierarchy. So you can listen to those. They're only like 20 minutes each. And I think we did five of them. And there's an article that goes with it. If you'd like to read more about that, we were happy to do that for um, Pennsylvania. Okay. Now, when you move into the mastery range, you have to leave behind the tactics that you were using when you were trying to build fluency because you don't need them anymore. They're, kids are as fluent as they're ever gonna be. You know, if this should resonate with you when you're teaching reading. You don't want kids to just read faster for the sake of reading faster. There's a point of real diminishing returns in that metric and it really becomes about comprehension, right? Or um, in the world of math, we would say, can they handle novel tasks? Can they apply what they have learned to solve a new problem type? Um, can they uh, provide a fuller explanation of their mathematical reasoning? So we are looking for different instructional tactics when children enter the mastery range of performance. Okay, whoops, I was gonna draw a picture of the skill by treatment interaction and I didn't. Okay, now this is a scatter plot and these are real data and this is showing you um, every child's performance. I think these were fourth grade kids and this is a multi-digit multiplication task. And this is showing you their fluency score on the x-axis plotted against their accuracy score on the y-axis. And I like to show this because it makes it apparent how we get, we make, we have to time kids sometimes to understand their proficiency. Before they're accurate, we can just pay attention to accuracy. But once, once they have become accurate, we really must introduce timing, at least for our assessment decisions, if not our actual in, uh, instructional practices. Although for fluency building, timing is an important piece of it. For acquisition, timing is not. For uh, generalization opportunities, timing is not important. For fluency building, it is. But for assessment, timing is almost always valuable. And here's how it works. So a teacher may say that children above 80% or above 90% are accurate. So they have mastered this content and they are ready for more challenging work in math. But what we know is that actually children who perform to the left of that dash line are actually in the frustrational range of performance. Children who perform between the two dash lines are in the instructional range of performance. And children who perform above, you know, to the right of the final dash line are in the mastery range of performance. Now, what I want to tell you is all human behavior um, would be graphed this way. So not just math, but could be, you know, learning how to, you know, I don't know, play tennis, some kind of tennis swing you're trying to master or some type of musical performance or learning a foreign language. Errors are much more prevalent when an understanding is new. It's in the acquisition. That's how we define it, right? You you're not 
independently accurate in performing the skill. So this should resonate with you too if you've done a lot of oral reading fluency. It's never the kid who's reading, you know, 100 words read correctly per minute who's making 12 errors. It's, that's rare. That would be very unusual. It's the kid who's reading three words correctly per minute who's making six to 10 errors, right? Because the errors occur when the performance is um, very disfluent. And so that beautiful kind of asymptote that you get occurs in all areas, reading, math, and in fact, we've talked about music, foreign language, uh, any beha behavior that could be learned will actually progress in this way. It's very predictable. So what happens is, the instructional range we said is characterized by rapid growth and high accuracy and the mastery range is characterized by skill retention so you retain that skill over a longer period of time and you have flexible and adaptable skill use so what that means is if you are saying these children have mastered this understanding or even like let's say you you just apply it to the smaller circle of the 90 percent then the teacher is making a decision that it's incorrect. So the teacher is saying these children have mastered this understanding, they're ready for more challenging iterations of work. And actually what we know is these children will not retain the skill. We come back in two months and measure they won't be able to do it. They will no longer be accurate. They will not be able to use that skill to have faster learning of more complex related content, okay? So we want to avoid using the accuracy criterion because it will cause us to miss kids. So how can we, how can we do it differently? We wanna time kids. We wanna time their performance and use a fluency score to say children who are between 40 and 80 digits correct per two minutes or in the instructional range, look at what happens to accuracy right? It's very few children who are even below 90% accuracy who have attained this level of fluency. And look what happens over here for mastery. Virtually nobody is below our threshold for accuracy. And that's the way it always works. So that's why we use, that's why we use uh, timed assessment. We want to determine that these children in the green are ready for more challenging work. And that's basically, that is exactly how we have built the decision rules that drive um, all of the decisions within um, Spring Math. All right, so how to plan instruction using science this is another picture of the instructional hierarchy. And this comes from Herring and Eaton's um, book, the, the actually Herring, um, Eaton, Love It, Eaton, and Hansen, the fourth R, Research in the Classroom, which is, I've, I've got it on my shelf. It, it's an old book, but a great book. This is the first book to define it. This book is still a wonderful read. You know, sometimes you're going to see this. The, first of all, they did break it into uh, four stages. So they separated generalization and adaptation. But we combine them because when they say generalization, fundamentally, they're talking about stimulus generalization. And when they say adaptation, they're talking about response generalization. So we simplify it. You know, from 1978, we can simplify this a little bit because those were new concepts at that time. The other thing I want to tell you that I really think happened, you will hear people in Pennsylvania refer to adaptation as adaption. I think that was a typo in the book. It's not, it doesn't, nobody ever talked about adaption in the literature. It's adaptation. Just that little, <laughs> little something you might find, find interesting, but you'll run into it. You'll hear people say that and probably what they really mean is adaptation. So this is a summary of what I've just told you. So whoops, in the acquisition stage of learning, our goal is to build accuracy. These are the tactics that are evidence-based that will help take us toward that accuracy. In the fluency building stage, our, performance, our goal is to build uh, fluency, which is defined as accuracy plus speed. And the tactics that work to do that are defined here. And then in generalization and adaptation, our goal is to build um, generalization. And so the tactics will include things that are listed here. This is your map to personalize or customize instruction. And the goal is to figure out, this is why differentiation fails. If differentiation could carry this off every single day, it would produce ginormous effects in results. But this is hard to do. So this is what, to the extent that you can use this as a map to plan an individual intervention, or you can use it to do something really sort of clever and efficient which is what we have done with class-wide math intervention is situate that as a fluency building intervention that supplements your core instruction and use that to build fluency for um, expected learning outcomes. And that's where class-wide math intervention lives.
So how to for class-wide interventions. First of all, I want to give you a protocol to do it. And if you click on this link and you'll have these slides, but we certainly we can copy this and put it right in the chat if people want to do that too. Um, it's going to take you basically to this page. This is a snapshot of the web page. And if you if that link for some reason doesn't work for you when you try to use it, you're just going to navigate this path. So springmath.com how it works, view a, sam a sample class-wide intervention. And what we're doing is we're just giving you a concrete, I asked them to put this up so that places could try it and see um, how it works. It really is a very simple um, process. And what we've given you is a packet that has the protocol. The protocol really doesn't change that much. There are different versions for kindergarten. Um, for elementary, I think that's the protocol we've given you, yes. That one is standard, so you would have, you've got the protocol now. And then for uh, grade seven and up, we use different language because kids are older and we don't want to talk to them in baby ways like, you know, oh, your brain is a math muscle and you need to use your ears for listening. So we just use older language, but the active ingredients don't change. And you um, have a set of materials to conduct class-wide intervention for a specific skill. So we gave you that. Um, it's a we have it, you know, unique and specific to every grade level and the skills that go with that grade level. So I'm sorry if the skill doesn't work at your grade level, but it does at least give you a concrete view of how it could work and how you could try this in in your um, in your setting. So how to Dr. get started? Hayden, yes, we had a question um, about fluency. Uh, for students who have poor processing speed, is it reasonable to expect that their fluency will increase to expected levels? Yeah, so you know, you might imagine we get that question a lot. And I think that question is somewhat related to um, the question about the low performers in class-wide intervention and high performers in class-wide intervention. And so we often get the question, do the low performers grow comparably to the high performers? And if we don't get that question, we get the other, do the high performers grow comparably to low performers? The answer is everybody grows given class-wide intervention. We do see growth for every band that we might take. And it's important for people to understand that these tactics that I'm talking about that are the active ingredients that are embedded within these tools, the best intervention research came out of special ed. So many of these tactics were actually built on the very types of kids that you are worried about and have demonstrated the strongest available effect sizes of other tactics that we might try like productive struggle or untimed performance. Um, that's why we use them. That's why we chose them because we know these are tactics that can work. Every single human being can beat their score from the day before, even children with processing disorders. Now, will they maybe eventually hit a ceiling? Yes, everybody will hit a natural ceiling, but the criteria that we are using are absolutely the children who we work with in K-12, all children are capable really of, uh, well, I shouldn't say, it is a rare child who is not capable. And that child really probably is being accommodated in other ways because maybe they're not even writing or doing things like that. So um, for the most part, the vast majority of children, even the very children that I know you, you're referring to are absolutely 100% capable of meeting the criteria. And here's why it matters. If they don't, functionally, they have not accomplished what they need to be able to master um, more challenging content that is forthcoming. They won't be able to solve a word problem. They won't be able to put that skill to, to use in learning related context, uh, content more rapidly. So may, let me say that in a concrete way. Um, we, we, I built, really put this out at scale between 2002 and 2005 in Vail, Arizona. And uh, we had a multiple baseline across schools and we were doing class-wide intervention system-wide. So we brought that little district from middle of the pack in math proficiency in the state to rank order position number one. And they've stayed there ever since and they moved all their special ed kids. In fact, they moved them so dramatically that their eligibility rate in their district went from 6% to three and a half percent, and they got all kinds of national uh, accolades for that work. But we did it via class-wide intervention. And those children showed more growth than they had shown, we actually looked at this empirically, for years of core instruction. But part of it was we really believed in the data-based individualization work that we were doing, and that what we needed to do is maybe provide 
um, in some cases, a higher dose or a backing up of content. And so what I'm telling you is that's why the MTSS layering works. If you have a child in class-wide intervention who is not keeping pace with the rest of the class, it's not really relevant to try to say, is this child capable of ever mastering this content? I mean, first of all, you can't say such a thing. You would not, there's no way to even measure that to make a distinction. But what we would say is that as a child who needs to now have individualized diagnostic assessment and an individual intervention, because it could be that that child is not able to master as rapidly as other children because of a processing disorder, but it could be also that the fact that this child has this problem in this child's life, that perhaps there are other gaps instructionally that we can go back and customize in a customized measured way, repair that will open up faster progress and better learning. And in fact, that's what we see. So we measure when children are getting individual intervention, performance on what we are targeting and performance on what we call the goal skill, which is our generalization skill. And what we find is there's always, man, this would be a great study. There's always a threshold that when kids hit in the individual intervention target skill, both in proximity to the goal skill and also a threshold of proficiency, boom, we suddenly see the goal skill take off. We see this over and over at every grade level. So the, that's a long answer, but the short answer is absolutely 100% yes. And if I didn't answer that well, I need you to give me a follow-up in the chat that Matt can share with me or we can talk through further. But we have to figure out how to get this message out to teachers and parents because the caring behind the question is, I don't wanna ask children to do that which is not possible. And I need to be able to tell this story in a way that teachers and parents can feel like that's not what is happening here. That yes, it is possible. And it might look like individualized intervention for a while, but all children can beat their own score from the day before if the instruction is correctly aligned with their proficiencies. Is that good? Okay, so um, intervention, you gotta have an intervention protocol to get started. These are sort of like, these are the materials to organize. I've given you one to practice if you want. If you use our tool, you have it, you'll, you know, it's fed to you as you need it. Um, you need a sequence of skills. So the way we built our original sequences, I built them in when I was in Arizona and we've subsequently, this is pre common core, but we've tested them and we've made tweaks over the years. We still, we made a tweak this year. We added, um, for sixth grade, we added fine percent of a whole number and we added uh, rapid quantity comparison with integers. And for seventh grade, we added complex fractions. And when we add something, it's a big deal because it means it has to be added in a way that's conceptually coherent throughout the whole tool. That means assessment, progress monitoring, decision rules, um, intervention protocols, class-wide intervention, where it lives in the sequence, all of that. And it populates in our growth tab. So it's a big deal to make an addition. We're, we're very thoughtful about that. And I'm gonna tell you right now, complex fractions was a personal one for me because my daughter was in uh, seventh grade last year and she has always done well in math and she hates spring math as she tells me because it makes you think and understand math and she doesn't need that to be able to do math. Um, but she ran into complex fractions and she said, this makes no sense to me at all. And I thought, it's just division of fractions. That's why we don't have it on our tool. How is this confusing? Well, based on that, what I learned just firsthand as a parent, I said, oh, we need this in our tool. And so we knew last September we were going to add it for this year. And that has, that has now been done. So you need a sequence of skills. So let me tell you how you could do it if you don't use our tool. This is what we, this is what I did originally. If I'm working with third, third grade and I want to build a math sequence, then I'm asking this question. I'm going to go to second grade teachers and I'm going to say, I'm sorry, fourth grade teachers. What is, what are the deal breaker skills that if you could say, if every child comes in at mastery for the following skills, I can't, I am set up for success in fourth grade. And we wanted these to be measurable. We wanted these to be really essential foundation skills. So in math, it is absolutely the truth that, as you probably know, that not all skills are equal, and understandings are equally important, but there are some that are big deal, deal breaker skills, and that's what we were after. So skills associated with place value understanding in third grade, big deal. Um, 
skills associated with um, fractions and proportions in fifth grade. Big deal. So we give the attention where we know these are the most essential understandings. You know, I'll just give you a great example. Knowing that this is called a triangle with little kids, it turns out it's not a deal breaker skill. It's not what will keep you out of eighth grade algebra, but we can pick you out in kindergarten as not being on track for eighth grade algebra success based on your ability to fill in a missing number in a number sequence that's, that is in you know, the counting sequence. Um, we can pick you out based on your ability or our inability to count and select a matching quantity, state a matching quantity, or write a matching quantity. That will very reliably pick you out. So we want to we want to focus on deal breaker skills. So you can build that yourself, and your your yours would not be that far off from what we have built. We have published our you know in the the old original skills are published in the literature. You can find them. Uh, there's a paper in 2005 with Matt Burns um, that we published the the sequences in. And, and they've changed a little bit, but I've learned a lot in the interim, but that would give you a starting place too. Um, you gotta have daily practice materials. And that's really important because, you know, when I first started building what, what we now call spring math, I, you know, I built it myself, I, I paid for it myself. Um, because I really felt like it was just so necessary and I thought I could do research with it. I can use it when I train teachers. And my husband said to me one time, well, at least if nothing else, you're going to have a great probe generator when this is over <laughs> with. And that's true because you need a way to get high quality practice materials. And these are hard to find. We used to use like basic skill builders, which doesn't exist anymore. I mean, you can buy it out of print. And then we would take those master pages and cut them up and move the problems around. So we would not get, you know, these practice effects where kids are just memorizing the first four answers and things like that. So you need, you need a source for good practice materials. We built them and you can build them. We used to build them in Workhouse, uh, Schoolhouse Technologies, Worksheet Factory. We, uh, the inter Intervention at, um, oh gosh, Jim Wright's site, interventioncentral.org. You can build some practice materials there that look like measures. That's fine. They're still well-controlled practice materials. You just can't do that much. You probably won't have the level of uh, customization that you want available in that setting. You can, they don't have to be perfect if you do, you do the best you can with what you can find. So you can also harvest printed materials that you have on hand. Um, I excel is a practice site. It's online, but the practice materials for especially through grade three are not terrible. I remember buying IXL for my kid. My kids, I was somewhat dismayed to see that their effect sizes are, are somewhat crummy in their published research. But um, again, I think that's because there's a disconnect between the teacher's instructional delivery and that practice material. Um, and then you need weekly assessment materials. And this is where you do have to have good assessment. I can't advise you to use something that has not been validated for um, assessment. So you need a good set of uh, assessment materials to track your progress. And then you need criteria to know when children have reached uh, mastery and they're ready for the next um, skill in the sequence. And hopefully a way to graph progress for teachers. I used to do it in Excel before I built my tool and um, implementation support structures. And I want you to know I ran this system wide in many systems using Excel, printed materials, you know, on a wing and a prayer. And it is doable. It's just a lot of uh, a lot of work that is it's required to um, to pull that off. Okay, let's see. So you want to put kids into working pairs and you can do this by clicking a button and we give you a list. These are the two who should work together. These are the two who should work together. So here's the thing. The way we do it is we take the graph from your screening and we take your highest performing kid and we match them with your lowest performing kid and then we continue to work our way to the middle. You would do the same for class wide reading intervention if you did that. Lynn Fuchs divides the class in half, takes the kid from the top half, matches it with the top kid from the bottom half, and continues that way. One way, the first way is called the fold method. The second way is called the slide method. Okay, but the idea is you are matching higher performing kids with lower performing kids and sort of middle kids with each other. And in all cases, your higher performing student is going to be the first worker. That's important. Second important piece is you can look at this list of students and you can rule out any oil and water personalities. Like if you don't like that suggestion, we have a button that you can click and resort and we'll give you another suggestion or you can just do it yourself. 
knowing, keeping the spirit of you need a higher performing and a lower performing student if possible. We ask you to keep those dyads stable for the first two weeks because that's when children are learning the routine and how to do the procedures embedded in class-wide intervention. And it's only as good as those active ingredients are carried out. So we ask you to keep it stable just to not introduce any confusion as kids are learning. Okay, after the first two weeks and kids have got the routine down, if you want to change it up a little bit, you absolutely can. And it helps to rotate your higher performing kids among the lower performing kids just to maintain interest and motivation and just kind of change it up. Certainly, if you have an odd kid out, you do not want the group that has to work as a group of three to always have to work as a group of three. So you want to change that up over time too, okay? Now, you got your kids in your working pairs, then this is how class-wide intervention um, should proceed. So this is a picture of the actual protocol that you can, you now have a copy of this that you can print from our site. And then uh, actually this graphic was built in Pennsylvania and we loved it so much that we use it and give it away. And um, anyway, the worker, their job, everybody's going to in the dyad, both people get to do both roles. Okay. So the first three minutes, the higher performing kids going to go first. Remember the worker is going, is going to be um, the higher performing kid. And the job of the worker is to work to solve the practice problems using their brain explaining their thinking aloud so the helper can hear how they are solving the problem. They can see how the child is solving the problem. And then writing the answer also. So they're, they're, um, they're thinking aloud, they're explaining their thinking, and they're solving the problem in writing. And the helper is listening and watching and using their mouth to help. And it takes a little bit of training in the beginning to train the helper not to just supply the answer, but instead to give a hint, to ask a question, to say, oh, stop, let's try that one again, do that one again. If they absolutely get stuck, they should raise their hand and notify the teacher because the teacher might want to do pause everybody, do a whole class 10 second reteach on the concept. Um, and then the other thing I want you to think about that's so beautiful about this is remember, it's a fluency building intervention. So errors should be rare. And the first worker is an effective model for the helper who is a low performing student. So before that child practices, they've had a model. That's a powerful intervention tactic, okay? The second piece of that is the first worker is less likely to make any errors. So the necessity or the capacity of this process to have that helper detect those errors is really not that important because errors are low probability. You get it? See how this kind of is cool? and it works as a fluency building intervention. Okay, then after three minutes working in that way, they switch roles and now the helper becomes the worker and the worker becomes the helper. They practice for three minutes. This goes by very quickly. The teacher is the timekeeper. And then everybody does an independent practice page and went for times, it, in elementary, it's two minutes. So they'll practice, you know, on their own answering problems for two minutes. And then the teacher will stop everybody. They trade papers, they score. The um, owner gets their paper back and the owner has to correct any errors that they made and explain out loud to their math buddy how they corrected the error. And there are higher quality explanations and lower quality explanations and that's okay. We, you train them up in that. Um, and then when all of that is complete, so we've got practice, practice, timed independent practice, scoring, error correction, then there's a motivation piece at the end. So the teacher has a goal for the day. The teacher will randomly or not so randomly, wink, wink, um, choose a paper from the day. She doesn't say who the paper belongs to, but if the score exceeds the goal, then the entire class gets some you know, celebration, you know, five minute reward privilege that like free time or something like that. Some teachers will use tangible rewards. That's fine too. That is adaptable to the classroom and should be based on what the teacher finds agreeable. But I will tell you this, you know, we've done this you know, over 20 years and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, well, now probably easily over a thousand classrooms. We know what the errors are that people tend to make. And the two that tend to, the two errors, well, the most common error is it doesn't get done at all. So the intervention gets skipped altogether, right? That's ubiquitous. 
Um, but when the intervention occurs, but occurs incorrectly, there are two common sources of error in class-wide intervention, and they are that the error correction gets dropped or the motivation piece gets dropped. So it tends to be that when the teacher starts it, the teacher's engaged and really tending to that, but then it's just sort of natural human behavior. They've been doing it for a while, they have it down. And so the teacher is, knows well, we're at the end of the intervention. You guys know what to do, correct your errors, and then the teacher sort of gets their head down planning for the next thing. And lo and behold, kids don't do it. And what we can do is we can sit outside of the classroom in another state and watch the trajectories in the classroom and they will tell us that that happened. So we, that's now we're able to say inside your coach dashboard, you need to go visit this classroom because something is going wrong with this intervention. And usually it's either skipping the intervention altogether, that's the most common error, but the other two errors are missing those, those final uh, two pieces. And I point all that out to say that, that when you know about it, you can manage your training and your support to try to pre-correct for that, or just yourself as a manager of your own behavior, as a teacher, you can go, okay, those are the soft spots I need to look for. That, often get missed. The active ingredients, if you wanted to say what are the research-based active ingredients of class-wide intervention, oh, I should make a little graphic for this, that would be nice. Um, but modeling, uh, practice at the right level of difficulty, so we are deliberately choosing skills that we know children tend to be accurate on, so we know they are ready for this fluency building practice. We are embedding lots of opportunities to respond. You could also call those complete learning trials. Um, there's corrective feedback embedded in the process at the practice piece and also at the end. There's uh, goal setting, so trying to beat their score from the day before. We have little tracking sheets on our site that you can print that kids can keep at their grade at their desk. And it's almost like a little board game where they get to color in squares to try to meet the goal for each class-wide intervention skill themselves. And they're just trying to grow. So they're just trying to beat their score from the day before. There's the delayed error correction at the end with the verb, it's called a verbal rehearsal component that mostly was supported by Lynn Fuchs research and we ended up um, embracing that too in our, in our model. There's a reward piece and then there is um, advancing difficulty based on proficiency. So we don't go up. In fact, um, when Vail adopted Spring Math, I went out to train them because I have a relationship with them and um, I mean not a fiscal relationship just a love relationship really there I love those leaders and so I went out to do the training myself and spend time in their district it was so great a teacher came up to me and she had I, we were just watching class-wide intervention in like eighth grade and she came up to me because she saw I was a visitor didn't know me and she says oh, let me explain what we're doing. And she shows me a protocol and she starts telling me how class-wide intervention works and what it's about. And I'm like, I know, I built it here in this district like 20 years ago, that's my old protocol. <laughs> so cool, I loved it. But they still were doing class-wide intervention. But one of the modifications they made when I left is they said, if a class is stuck on a skill, after three weeks, we're just moving them on. And I remember when they told me they did this, I, in my head, I thought, why would you do that? And then out loud, I was proud of myself, I had a filter. Out loud, I said, can I see your data? So they sent me their data, and I want you to know that the probability of those children mastering future skills and um, covering more content plummeted to zero. So any class that was moved on without hitting mastery did not experience continued success. So it's, Sort of goes back to like, you know, the kid with the processing problem, can they really accomplish, you know, sometimes with classes, there's a feeling like if they're stuck on this skill, they're not getting any benefit from the intervention and they're not going to get to all this really important skill skills that I know they need and will help them. But early mastery sets the stage for future, future skill mastery in a way that is unavoidable. So when children are not moving forward in the sequence of skills and class-wide intervention, you never want to say, let's just move them on anyway. What you want to say is, let's figure out why. Can we tweak this in some way to get a better result? Can we move kids faster? Do we need to reteach a sub skill? So we've built in some things to try to help with that, but it's the wrong answer to just enter fake scores and move kids on. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So we're in the last five minutes here. And I'm going to save that. You did have one question a little earlier. Yeah. About IXL and um, 
whether or not there has been success with this type of practice, what the research is saying about IXL? Um, unfortunately, and very disappointingly so, no. And you know, honestly, I guess I'm not that surprised by that because I used to do a little bit of um, advising to Renaissance Learning and you know, they have a practice tool called Accelerated Math. And Accelerated Math on the surface looks like it should produce amazing results. But there's something about both of those tools that are not bad, you know, the, the practice materials themselves are fine. The sequence with which they are arranged, very sensible, makes sense, but their data are underwhelming. And I think it's because there is not this in tandem relationship between um, core instruction, this sort of positioning of supplemental instruction with measure performance at the class level to know when children should go up in difficulty or not. The SMART score is opaque. I don't know what that means. I can remember my own kid being finally at the right SMART score. It's my oldest one who's about to go to college now. And he would literally type in the wrong answer. And I mean, just invert two numbers and drop back to 80 and be in tears. And then I would be, I would have to literally stand with him and say, I have to approve the answer before you hit submit, <laughs> you know, we can't go through this every, every time. So there's, I don't, I don't know why it doesn't work, but the data are underwhelming. Um, I don't mind sending you my notes on IXL. I've, I've read their research study. I can send you the research study a link to it. You could read it yourself. And I can also send my notes associated with it. And this is coming from somebody who bought it for her own children. I advised my kids school to buy it school wide, offered to pay for it if they were going to do it um, at the time. So, uh, but again, the data are underwhelming and I don't understand really what that is about. Uh, I think it has to do with too much flexibility around allowing the teacher to assign skills whichever skills they want to assign. There's not always necessarily a coherent flow and progression from one skill to the next based on how teachers assign. The amount of engagement with the tool can be problematic. You know, you see that with like uh, Dreambox and other tools like that, that kids are, you know, technically online, but how engaged are they really during those uh, practice intervals? So I think all of that contributes noise. And I can't say why the results are underwhelming, but I can say the results are in, in their own available data are, are somewhat um, disappointing. Um, okay, so I talked about all of this. I wanna go, I wanna cover two things related to um, dosage real quick if I can. So, uh, you know, if you're tempted, especially in our context now to say, let's just, we'll do it less frequently, but for a longer interval of time, I wanna show you why that is a bad idea in instruction. This translates reading, math, everybody's finding this, but this is a paper, a study, an RCT actually that Robin Cotting and I did, and, and two, we did it, I think in 2014, published it in 2016. But, um, but basically we randomly assigned kids to groups. Everybody got the most identical thing we had researchers delivering it. We measured what they got. It was super well controlled. It actually got article of the year in the uh, journal that it was published in. And um, the progress monitor control group grew like this. And by the way, this is using the class-wide math intervention but from spring math, but in a um, small group setting. It, in the once a week group, we did 40 minutes of so we did actually four batches of class-wide intervention in 10 minute doses, but it was in one single 40 minute session once per week. And that group was no different than control. Okay. Then again, equivalent and by random assignment, the second group got two batches of class. So 20 minutes twice a week of the class wide interventions. They got, they got the same as the control. I mean the, the once per week group, but they got it in two doses and they grew like this. And then we had a group that got, four sessions a week, 10 minutes per session, which is really the way we recommend for spring math and they got that effect. 
So the takeaway is the dosing is really important. And unfortunately, it causes us to have to tackle something that's really tough in school schedules, which is to use shorter intervals of intervention time, but to make sure we're doing them more frequently. So daily is ideal. And in some cases, we, you know, we've seen in the Oklahoma work, multiple research researchers in Oklahoma are finding you can do it on the same day as long as you have a little separation. Well, that's a silver lining. Because if you're in an altered schedule this year, you could do a double dose of class-wide intervention. And guess what? You're not giving up one ounce of your effect. That's powerful. That's like, that's what I want to know if, if I'm in your shoes. How can I carry off what I need to and not give up results on learning? Okay. And then the last thing I wanted to show is, remember I said we can watch trajectories and we know there's a problem before we ever go in the room? So on the right is a picture of class-wide intervention where we know there's a problem. We know there is an integrity threat here. Something is going wrong. And over here is a picture of a class before we ever go in. We know that they're, they're having success with the implementation of this intervention. So because this is so knowable to us, it's easy for us to write a little rule that tells the coach dashboard, Houston, there's a problem. <laughs> go check here. Don't go here. Things are okay. Don't spend your time checking on this teacher this week. If you have limited time, you want to go over here. So I think I covered what I wanted to, and I situated class-wide intervention, importantly, as a fluency building intervention within the instructional hierarchy. When we do our next session, I'm going to talk about individual intervention where we can be more customized and we can actually do acquisition intervention and we can do, or we can do fluency building intervention based on the measured student in front of us and what they need. And I think that's it. I'm 946 in my time, so 1046 your time. Thank you all. Um, Dr. Vanderhaen, you're staying in this room for the next session, mm -hmm. which begins at 1050. Okay. We have a, about a four minute break. Oh, so you said 10, 1050? 1050. Okay, I thought you said 15. <laughs> oh, okay. At least that's what I saw on the matrix. Let me just double check. It's okay with me. I'm good. I have 11 o'clock. Sorry. Oh. 11 o'clock is the start time for the next one. Okay. Well, if you want to scan, if there's any questions in that chat, I can definitely take another question before. Still done. Um, the only new question was if you could send the notes and data for IXL and we'll put it into the materials section, into the folder. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me see. Where did I just cite that in a paper this weekend? Why don't I send you, I did Dreambox too. I'll send you that one if you want to read. That would be lovely. And what was the third one? Oh, I looked at iReady too. And I'll send you that one too. Okay, this one. Oh, and this is the map study. If you wanted the map study that showed that differentiation didn't really happen, I'll just put it in there. Is that okay? Yes, that'll be fine. Right. Uh, Trina, yes. You can just stay in this room for Dr. Vander Hayden's next session. Let's see if do all. Everyone. And if you have other data requests, speak now. Ooh, maybe Sharon Kuhn's paper. The one that shows advanced course sequences don't matter. Such a good paper. So I'm putting a Google Doc in the folder with these items on there. We have this on our website, but that's our theory of change. 
choice. That's something to look for that we say people should, like there's certain things you should look for when you're, when you're looking at um, adopting a tool for your school. And one of the things is that they're very explicit. What is the mechanism of action? And how does it work? How does it improve achievement? Places don't always do that well. They don't always articulate what's the active ingredient. Uh, give me a second. I mean, I might have been wrong about the room number. Oh. Uh, you are not staying in this room. You'll be moving on to I looked at the last three. I didn't look at the last six. There are there is a change to the next room. Okay. So can You're you saying, get, can you give gonna, all those references out, or do you need me to save them? I already put the references in a Google Doc. Okay. Um, for us, so they should be there in the materials section. And I also put the Zoom link for you for the next session. Oh, in the chat. thank you. Oh, that's so nice. That makes life a little easier. Let's see if I can copy it, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna hop out and go to the next one. And uh, we should have someone in there to assist you there. Okay, thanks, bye. Bye.